Hello. I'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with us for our online Bible study. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for our time together today. We pray that you bless us as we once again look into the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that it would help us and be an encouragement to us. And we pray, Lord, that the things that we hear and learn today, that we would, by your grace, apply them to our lives as well. So bless this time, we pray, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight we're in Psalms 15. And if you've been keeping up with your Bible reading, uh, which we as a church have been doing as we read through the Bible chronologically, uh, today you will, of course, have noticed that um, the psalm that we're looking at is one of the psalms that would have been in your prescribed Bible reading. I didn't plan it like that. I don't think there'd be any way that I would be able to have that kind of a foresight. But it's just worked out that way. And a few days ago, you will have noticed that, um, as you read in the book of uh, Chronicles, as the uh, uh, ark was brought up from kirjath Jerem to be uh, placed in Jerusalem after a period of some 20 years, that kind of what you looked at a couple of days ago in Chronicles it was is somewhat a, a preparation for what you have in this particular psalm. David had erected a tent, like a tabernacle, and he erected it and placed it in Jerusalem, prepared it for a dwelling place, a housing place for the Ark of the Covenant. And so David is residing in his own house and he's looking out across the way and we can almost in our minds I think of him uh, considering the Ark of the Covenant there in the tabernacle. And as he thinks about that and he thinks about those that would one day abide with him for all eternity, he reaches for his pen or writing implement of some sort and he begins to pen this great psalm. So let's read together from verse 1 of Psalms 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbour, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbour, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoureth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. This uh, psalm, if you like, speaks about and addresses the subject as to who will one day go to heaven. The psalm describes the person or the kind of person that is going to dwell with God for all eternity. Heaven will be his home and God will be in his presence and for all eternity. We who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ will be able to worship and serve our great God. So David is thinking about the kind of person that would dwell in heaven. And of course this is given by inspiration of God. So we have here, this is God's standard for those that would one day live with him in heaven. Now you'll remember that last week we looked at Psalms 14. And in Psalms 14 we considered the psalm as a summary of a fool. The fool, they said in his heart, there is no God. You know, it's surprising today that there are people that think that uh, a person can go through their life as an atheist, go through their life hating God, rebellion towards God, never read the word of God, never pray, never praise, never come to the house of God to worship. But to think that, that, such, that such a person would die and go to heaven. That might be a popular notion today, but of course that is a, it's a ridiculous thought. Because God is the one that sets the standard for those that are going to abide in his presence. And of course, we are mindful of the fact that God is a holy God. And God will not accept and not allow any unholy or unclean thing into his heaven. But the Bible does tell us and describes for us the kind of person that would be welcome 
uh, in the presence of God for all eternity. And Psalms 15 lays out some of the characteristics of the person that would one day go to heaven. So there are three things I'll draw to your attention as we look at this psalm. There's firstly uh, a question that we are uh, confronted with. So the Bible poses a question and we'll see as to how the Bible gives an answer and then also we'll also consider as to how the Bible gives us an assurance. But let's firstly consider the Bible's question. As we begin the psalm, we are confronted with this question. The, the Bible says in verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now this kind of a question, this Bible question, is an important question. And in fact, when you come across questions in the Word of God, they aren't questions that are the, the thoughts of a daydreaming mind. These are serious questions. They have eternal consequences. And so the question that is posed here in this psalm is a searching question, and it's designed to bring us to a, a good conclusion. So it impresses upon man the need of salvation because the question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, is quite searching. Who is going to be that person that would dwell with God for all eternity. So when we think of the tabernacle, the tabernacle was that tent that was designed to travel with the Israelites in their wandering journeys through the um, uh, wilderness and leading them into the promised land. It was a, a place that was designed to house the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the very dwelling place of God. And David, as he thought about the tabernacle, or the tent that he had erected, and he thought about the Ark of the Covenant safely residing therein, he thought about those that would be able to dwell there with God. And even thinking further into the future, who would dwell for eternity with God? So he's not just thinking about that tent structure or even a little bit down the line in the future of the, the temple that his son Solomon would build, but he's thinking about an eternity. Who is going to dwell in the presence of Almighty God? So the question is, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, in his presence? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The indication is, of course, is that the tent that he had erected was placed in the very place where the temple would one day be built. And so he's musing, he's thinking about the kind of person that God would allow and enjoy in his presence. But humanly speaking, our response is, well, nobody can. None of us are able or worthy to dwell in the presence of Almighty God. The Bible tells us that we've all sinners and all of us have come short of the glory of God. There's none of us that do good. No, not even one. So there's not a person in and of themselves that can abide and stay in the presence of a holy God. But thankfully God has made the way possible that you and I as sinful men and women can abide in his presence. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. The Bible tells us that God took on human flesh. The Bible tells us that as a man, Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so through his death and his burial and resurrection, our Lord has made it possible that the believing sinner, sinner can be able to stand in the presence of a holy God. So we think about the righteousness that's required, the holiness that's required to be in the presence of God. Well, in Christ we have that. The Bible says, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
So all of our sins have been put to Christ's account and all of his righteousness has been put to our account. So we stand before God, uh, a group of people who are saved and indeed a group of people who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so who can abide, who will stay in the presence of Almighty God? Well, it's going to be those of us as, uh, as sinners who have recognized that our sins have separated us from God and with believing and repenting hearts, uh, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, asking for his forgiveness and calling upon his name, it's to those people that we're able to say we're saved and we will abide in his holy tabernacle and holy hill. So we can only dwell there because we have been made righteous by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? The Bible's answer is those that have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. As you read through the psalm, you see there's about 11 items that are mentioned. These 11 items that are mentioned uh, are given to us to give us proof, if you like, of the kind of person that would live in the presence of God because their lives have been so wonderfully changed. This is not a list of things that a person has to do in order to be accepted in God's heaven, because that would mean then that a person has to work for their salvation, and we know that's a total impossibility. So we recognize that this isn't a list of things that we're required to do in order to be saved. Rather, this is a list of things that describe the kind of life of a person who has been saved. So when we think of our Lord Jesus Christ and we think of his righteousness, and we have received his righteousness when we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we also recognize that the goal of the Christian is to become more and more like him. And so we want to be like Christ. And, and this wonderful list that is given to us in the psalm describes a Christian that is becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So this list, I must just repeat, isn't given to us so that we become God's children. Rather, this list is given to those that are already God's children. This is a standard that God expects you and I to live by. So in verse 2, we, we notice there that he speaks about the works of this person that is going to uh, abide in God's presence. It says, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. So David describes the life uh, or the walk of a person that would someday dwell with God. The word uprightly, it speaks about somebody that has no blemish or fault. <clears throat> so in the Old Testament, the Israelite who wanted to bring a special burnt offering to God, he would take uh, from out of his flock a, a full-grown ram and he would cast his eye over it very carefully to see if there's any blemishes it on the animal and he would run his, an his hands over the back and down the legs to make sure that this is an animal that was uh, without any kind of a blemish. Being satisfied that there was no fault in the animal, he would bring it to the priest. And the priest would also run his eye and his hand over the animal to make sure that it is an animal that would be acceptable to God, one without any imperfections or blemishes. It was a, lamb, a ram without blemish. And that's what uprightly means. It means without blemish. The person that would dwell in God's house would be one that is without blemish. His works and his words are going to stand uh, the test and the scrutiny of a holy God. And they can and they do because Jesus Christ, of course, is our righteousness. So the book of Philippians again tells us, chapter 2 and verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, 
Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. So this person is someone that's going to be righteous in his works. Also, we read that he'll be righteous in his words. And we read of this from verse 2 down to verse 4. But firstly, looking at verse 2, the Bible says he speaks the truth in his heart. And then in verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up reproach against his neighbor. When you think about our words, our words are really where our blemishes uh, show themselves more quickly. James, in his epistle, he had a remarkable test for the perfect man. He said in James chapter 3, verse 2, he said, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. So David speaks about the upright man and his secret words. The secret words are the words that he says in his heart. He speaks the truth in his heart. And our thoughts and our desires and our motives need to be pure. They need to be pure because if they're not, God will quickly find it out for what it is. Now the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 and verse 13 that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So God knows the, the secret thoughts of our hearts. And so it's not just a matter of saying the right things, it's a matter of thinking uh, the right things as well. And God is looking for and he expects truth in our hearts. And then he goes on and he speaks not just about the secret words, but the spoken words, what we say with our mouths. Verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. So here our Lord puts his finger upon four areas where we can sin with our words. And our words should be words that are going to be restrained. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. In other words, we are not to gossip. Sometimes as Christians, we've learned to call things by different names. We might say, I'm sharing a particular thing with you. But the Bible talks of it as being gossip or backbiting. And so we need to be careful against this sin. And, and in today's world, it is so easy to be guilty of the sin of, of backbiting another. Because no longer do we have to be standing uh, outside talking to our neighbor over the fence we can use our telephone to send a text or have a phone call or send an email or on social media. There's so many different ways that a person can be guilty of the sin of backbiting. And we do need to recognize that it's a terrible sin. We might think, well, it's just a small thing. It's just what I've said about another person. But God holds it in a very severe light. You know, when you think of Romans chapter 1, and Romans chapter 1 has got a quite a... Uh, serious and terrible catalog of sins there well in that list of terrible sins we see that God uh, uses the words like murderers and fornicators and homosexuals but he also speaks of those that are whisperers and backbiters to think that those sins are coupled with some of the most wicked th sins that you could think of so let me read that to you, Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. So our words are very important. It's not just the outward sins that uh, we should be concerned with but we need to be concerned with our words and so as we're controlled by God's Holy Spirit we're going to be very careful our words will be somewhat restrained and we'll be careful about the sin of backbiting 
But our words are not only restrained, they're also to be righteous. So it's not that we to speak no evil, but also the things that we do speak are going to be good things. So the person that would abide in God's tabernacle and dwell in his holy hill would have words that are righteous. When you think about unclean words, they reveal an unclean heart. The person that is uh, telling wicked stories or dirty jokes, uh, that's a person who has wickedness on their heart. As I've said to you before, what's in the well comes out in the bucket. Bad words don't just slip out of clean hearts. Bad words wait under the surface of worldly hearts. And so our words need to be righteous. They also need to be respectful. In Romans chapter 15, uh, Psalms 15 verse 4, in whose eyes a, a, a vile person is contemned, but he honoureth them that fear the Lord. So this person is going to be respectful. And he's not going to care for the words of the ungodly, but he's going to honour those that fear the Lord and treat them with the greatest of respect. And then the fourth thing about this person is that his words are reliable. Because it says, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So in other words, he's a person that keeps his word. What he says, he's going to do. Nowadays, you have to have a, a binding contract for a person to do what they said they would do. But uh, this kind of a person, rather his uh, bond, uh, his word is his bond. And so he will keep his word, even if it costs him. So we have the Bible's question, and then we have the Bible's answer. And then finally, I'd like you to notice in verse 5, there's the Bible assurance where the Bible says, He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Now this is a wonderful statement. It's a positive statement because it says that he, he's doing certain things. And so it talks about the things that he does. If you do these things that are spoken of in the Psalms, then you will not be moved. So it's referring to a lifestyle. It's referring to the way that you live your life. So the man of integrity here yeah, is going to be the kind of person that does the things that are mentioned in Psalms 15. But also it speaks of a wonderful steadfastness as well. Because the man who does these things, or the woman that does these things, the, the Bible tells us that they're promised that they'll never be shaken or slip away from that place of close fellowship and communion with God. So this is a promise that God gives, that God is going to support them. And the wonderful thing about the Christian life is that, you know, we're saved by faith and so we all, it's all of God. Our salvation is all of God and we're also kept by God's wonderful grace as well. So in Philippians chapter 2, we read that it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he gives us a desire and he also gives us the ability to do what he wants us to do. The psalmist said in Psalms 119, he said, How hold thou me up and I shall be safe. And so we recognize that God is the one that's able to keep us from falling. We, we look to him uh, to keep us. And by God's grace, as we look to God to keep us, we also have a quiet determination to endeavor to be steadfast and unmovable in all that we do. So the, the promise given to us in the word of God is that he that doeth these things is not going to be moved. So this is a psalm that speaks about the kind of person that would dwell with God in heaven for all eternity. Who shall abide in thy holy tabernacle? Abide in thy tabernacle. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. In verse 5, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. You know, as believers, we need to be mindful of the fact that there is a heaven waiting for us. God has prepared and is preparing a place for us. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You know, the words of our Lord are true words, aren't they? He is truth incarnate. And so he has promised us that he is preparing a place for us in heaven. And as we go through life's journey, we should ever be resting upon this wonderful promise that we have a home in heaven. Some people will tell you, well, heaven is just a state of mind. It's just a condition. Uh, Heaven is what you're going to experience when good things happen to you. Well, that's not true. There is a literal heaven, a real heaven that is waiting for you. If you read in the book of Revelation and you look at the last couple of chapters, you'll see as to how heaven is described in great detail. It's a place that has streets. It has foundation. It has walls. Jesus says it has mansions. And it tells us that he is there as well. Our Lord is literally in heaven in a resurrected glorified body and there he awaits for you and I as well. And Jesus says that um, where I am there you may be also. So we are encouraged by that. So the psalmist thought and posed the question, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Well, because of God's marvellous grace, because of our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can say most, most assuredly, I will. I will be there. May the Lord bless you as you think about this psalm and may it be an encouragement to to you as you reflect upon the fact that you have a home reserved in heaven with Christ. May God bless you. Goodbye.